Are you planning on celebrating tonight? The end of 55 years of pain with uh, the Euros and the potential that England might actually win. For us, it's been a good weekend for parties. We had a wedding blessing yesterday and it's our wedding anniversary today. So even if England lose, or even if we don't bother to watch, there may well be some celebrations going on. Our reading tonight takes us to a birthday party, to Herod's birthday party. But it's not the joyous occasion that he might have hoped. To get into this story, you probably need to know the family background. It's a bit confusing because just about everybody is called Herod and they use secondary names or nicknames to distinguish them. Now, quick diversion. To get your head around this royal family of Herods, you need to abandon any attempt to imagine it as an episode of The Crown. Netflix looks at our royal family through the lens of duty. Personal relationships are secondary to that, and holding on to power is being about being unremarkable, not upsetting anyone. Strong opinions or scandal might bring an end to the monarchy. Instead, picture the Tudors. Wolf Hall, the other Berlin girl? Which sorts of historical fiction do you like best? I love them, despite the fact that everybody seems to be called John or Richard or Henry. Now, in the Tudor period, power is about us being, being as close as possible to the king. Sons might bring friendship, or of course, they might be good in battle. But daughters' greatest use to their families is to win power by marrying them into a more powerful family. It might be one of your uh, neighbouring aristocracy. It might be marriage with rulers of other nations. But this is a dangerous game. To have too much power makes you a threat. And for those holding power, particularly the king, the greatest threat is often, from those with most power, members of his own family. Family was a great threat in Herod's family. Now, King Herod the Great, he was the Herod who was around at the birth of Jesus. And during his life, he kept changing his world to make different heirs. So first of all, he chose the two sons of his favourite wife, but they were executed. Next, he chose his oldest son, Antipater, but Antipater was convicted of trying to poison him. Finally, he gets round to choosing his youngest son, Antipas, the Herod in today's story. That sounds good, except that in his last illness, he changes his mind again and says that power should be shared between Antipas and his two brothers, Archelaus and Philip. And none of them should be king, they should be tetrarchs. Antipas tries to contest this. Herod was only king because the Romans let him rule. So Antipas goes off to Augustus, the Roman ruler, and says, let me be king. But the Romans went with Herod's last choice, King Herod's last choice, and divided the kingdom three ways, and Augustus, sorry, Antipas becomes tetrarch of um, a small part of it. Now, even more like the Tudors, Herod marries Philip's wife. Herod marries the wife of his brother and one of the people who has a chunk of the power he had hoped for for himself. This was so controversial, it provoked a war. And John the Baptist, who was never the most tactful, wants to have his say as well. Marrying a sibling, marrying your brother's wife, is completely outlawed in Leviticus. So that's John, why John the Baptist says, it shouldn't have happened. And very often when we think about biblical law, our minds go straight to sex. But I think this is much more about power. The wife Antipas 
uh, poached from Philip is called Herodias. And Herodias is so upset by John the Baptist, but she wants him dead. Herod is not going to agree to that, but he needs to pacify her. You know, Herodias as a woman has no real power here. But Herod Antipas, we see over and over again being really very weak. He is the ruler who Pilate sends Jesus to see him. Pilate doesn't know what to do about Jesus, so he sends him to Herod Antipas so that Antipas will deal with him. But Antipas doesn't want to upset anybody, he just sends him back. Antipas is quite dithery, really. So Herodias is on his case, killed John the Baptist. Herod says no, but he does imprison him to try and pacify her. And then he has this birthday party and gets carried away with showing off. Showing off is possibly another sign of weakness. He is so impressed by his daughter's dancing that he makes this rash promise. Now, again, we uh, movies about Salome, Herodias' daughter, often show her uh, doing the dance of the seven veils or something very sexualized. She may only have been a very young girl. We don't get that from the Bible text. But whatever it is that makes Herod, Herod so impressed with her, he's shown off to his mates and he says, you can have anything you want up to half my kingdom. That might not be the free promise you think. You think uh, Queen Esther, back in the Old Testament, her king makes exactly that promise to her and she knows she needs to be really cautious. If she misuses that chance, it will end in disaster. Salome goes to her mum, mum, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Um, Herodias spots her chance and says, ask for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. What is the sin here? What particularly is Herod's sin? I think the weight of the sin in this reading is about his misuse of power. And that is at least partly because he won't own the power that he has. Of course, there are people in the world who maliciously abuse power. But in my experience, abuse often comes from denying our power. And particularly this is true of Christians. We sometimes think that just to have power is sinful and forget that it's actually about how we use it. And our ambivalence about power leads us to misuse it because we don't notice what we're doing. Leading a better life in part comes from being aware of the power that we have. Power comes from all sorts of different sources. The source of our power might be our charm or our ability to intimidate each other. It might come from our status or our job, the role we play, even the role we play in church from our wealth, our education, our class, our gender, sexuality, the colour of our skin, our age. I'm sure you can think of many more factors that play a role. And typically humans think of themselves as less powerful than they are. But to act in holy ways, we need to be aware of the power that we have how we use it and how that is affecting others. Well, have I made this reading all about power just because I don't like talking about sex? You know what? The older I get, the more I think the morality of our relationships is really very dependent on how we use power within them and through them. And if I've lost you altogether, the only thing I have left to say is, enjoy the football tonight. Try not to behead anyone. <laughs>